Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome to another hour dedicated to exploring exactly what enlightenment means and what it is to be enlightened. This is an hour devoted to learning something more about ourselves, an hour designed to help us integrate all of our knowledge and perhaps even challenge some of our ideas about the world we live in and the people we have become. Indeed, an hour for the open-minded, willing to think and perhaps even risk their foregone conclusions in order to discover an entirely new dimension in their thoughts and being. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. Now, each week I read a few of your letters as our way of respecting the importance uh, that you play in our show. Last week our show was about what skeptics say about the paranormal, why they are wrong, and why it matters. And our guest was the author of Randy's Prize, Robert McLuhan. Jack commented, arrogant is the word for James Randy. I had one chance phone conversation with him, and it was not pleasant. Pamela wrote, I enjoyed the show and chat room today. I rushed home from work so I wouldn't miss it. Patty wrote, Thank you, E.T. The show Tuesday was so wonderful, and I connected with my fellow Baffle Gabber roomies. It's so fun to now put voices to the faces, as seen on Facebook, and the chattings of my, what I love calling, my P.E. friends. You and Rav have reached out to so many, but especially me over this past year. Thank you. Well, thank you, Patty, and we love your input in the chat room as well. Ravinder, what do you think of that? P.E. friends and baffle gabbers. We have fun. That's all I can say. It doesn't matter what anyone says about anything. We. I see great dialogue ourselves. in there. Great input. Great. It is. Great. Okay. Paula wrote, nice to know there is good evidence for at least some of the paranormal events we hear and read about. Also comforting to know that most of the skeptics are what you defined as pseudo-skeptics with their own invested opinions that they're trying to convince everyone of. Mr. McLuhan was a great guest who impressed me with his non-antagonistic attitude toward both sides of the debate. Thanks for the great show. Well, thank you, Paula, for your support and intelligent remarks. Elaine added, I love this guest today. Here is an intellectual who is open and wants to understand. Richard remarked, too short, fascinating, exciting to discover there is reason to find validity in some of this stuff. Rebecca wrote, I love hearing your show on Hay House Radio. Mariella wrote, I always listen to your show on Hay House Radio and learn so much. Marilyn wrote, always grateful for the continual learning which results from your program in my life. Salima wrote, love your show. You are awesome. I like these pithy comments. Okay, Maria wrote, love your outlook and really appreciate the fact that you question the questions in our lives. I have read several of your books and I don't always agree. However, at least you open the discussions and make us think about it all. Keep up the good work. I'm a great fan. Well, thank you, Maria. Questioning the questions is the best we can sometimes do. And we're very pleased that you question them with us. Jennifer wrote, let me tell you, I have been playing your inner talk CDs at night. I am feeling peaceful and at work, they said I am just smiling. I am in a situation where I know I should be upset, but I feel peaceful. These CDs are awesome, and I hope that everyone tries them. Well, thanks, Jennifer. And for all of you out there, remember that we have several free InterTalk programs. It's just a part of our own pay-it-forward effort. And you can get yours by going directly to InterTalk, I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K dot com. Check the left-hand navigation pane and choose free programs. It's that simple. That's InterTalk, I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K dot com. Lilia wrote, I recently purchased some of your Intertalk CDs. The change within five hours of listening was amazing. I feel so much mentally lighter. Thank you for your amazing technology. And KK wrote, I have some of your tapes from years ago and finally played one recently and noticed a difference by later that day. I want more. Thank you. All right. Well, now, thank you for your feedback, KK. You know, you must play the programs to get them to work. I wish something more simple like osmosis would do the trick. You know, you just having them around, maybe you touch them and somehow you absorb the information. But the next easiest way to find change is to play the Intertalk CD. We're glad you're playing them now. Okay, that's all the time we're going to take today for letters, but I do invite you to opine by sending your email to eldon at eldontaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. 
You can also just leave comments on my website. I do try to read all of your letters. Obviously, we can't get them all on the air, but they do impact our programming. I highly value your input, and I do encourage you to please provide your feedback. And once again, thank you for your continued support. Now to today's show, your life's purpose. Is it arrogant for someone else to tell you what your life's purpose is? How about telling you how to find your life's purpose? In today's world, with more and more emphasis being placed by the so-called and self-proclaimed intellectual elite on secular humanistic goals and reductionistic materialism agendas, is it even an intelligent question to ask about purpose as though there is something more than the pure randomness of nature? Many scholars and thinkers today dismiss out of hand the idea that the human condition is actually wedded in some way to some immaterial metaphysical necessity. The idea of God has become not only unpopular with the ACLU, but with mainstream academia. So purpose, is there some higher purpose to life or should we confine our inquiries to the more pragmatic side? That is, how do we maximize our pleasure, minimize our pain, and live as long as we can? Well, our guest today asked these questions in this way. Are you wondering why you're here? Are you asking yourself, what is my purpose? Do you feel frustrated by a deep sense of urgency around giving your greatest gift to the world? Are you struggling, passionately searching for exactly how to make a meaningful difference and finally live the life you were meant to live? Do you find yourself yearning for something greater that you know is inside of you? All right, now, I know what I think about purpose and the meaning of it all, but we want your input and your questions as well. So you're welcome to join us. All right, it's with a distinct sense of pleasure that I introduce to you our guest today. I've been reading her books and materials for some 25 years now. She's a true icon in her field. I'm speaking of Dr. Jean Houston, scholar, philosopher, and researcher in human capacities. She is one of the foremost visionary thinkers and doers of our time and one of the principal founders of the human potential movement. She is past president of the Association for Humanistic Psychology, director of the Human Capacities Training Program, and she ran the foundation for mind research out of Pomona, New York, where she and her husband, Robert Masters, tested the ESP of subjects under the influence of hypnosis and drugs. Houston is also on the editorial board of the Journal of Mind and Behavior. Bob Woodward identified her in his book, The Choice, and in doing so, let the world know that she was a friend and met with Hillary and Bill Clinton, and that Hillary had conversations, imaginary or otherwise, with Eleanor Roosevelt and Gandhi. Woodward also noted that in the past, Dr. Houston had been known to use LSD and hypnosis to help her clients converse with the great personages of his, per, yeah, the great people of history. <laughs> However, neither drugs nor hypnosis were used with the Clintons, according to Woodward. Dr. Houston is a powerful and dynamic speaker and a prolific author. Among her books are Beloved, The Hero and the Goddess, My Favorite, The Possible Human, Odyssey of the Soul, and The Search for the Beloved, Journeys into Sacred Psychology. She has worked intensively in 40 cultures and 100 countries, helping to enhance and deepen their own uniqueness while they become part of the global community. Well, welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Dr. Jean Houston. Oh, thank you so much, Eldon. But let me do a little few caveats there. I did not Dude. download Mrs. Roosevelt from the Cosmos for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I merely helped her write a book called It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. You, you really see what happens <clears throat> when things go go uh, uh, demonic, you know, on... on uh, when the press gets uh, a hold the of that. No, no, no. Yeah. And uh, in terms of LSD research, I did some of the government research, which ended as far back as 1965. I've done very little hypnosis. Uh, a great deal of my work is the development of human capacities, especially in the light of social change. Right now I'm working in Japan, in Zambia, in Nepal. Uh, I've worked in 107 countries, especially with the United Nations. I've been a consultant at the United Nations for many, many years. And UNICEF, helping, I know. Helping, mm -hmm. helping cultures uh, 
both preserve themselves while they move into this extraordinary new world. And my, my work does not involve drugs or hypnosis. So it's like a very, very ancient form you have. I am the head of a uh, institute for social artistry, which is where our work is literally uh, all over the world. But, yeah. No, and my very first question to you yeah. was going to be about uh, Bob's book and and the notoriety that grew up around that. Because, yeah. I mean, I can remember that it, it, that seemed to be like the, the press had jumped on it and they suddenly you were a psychic, you were yeah. a medium, sure. you were a trans channeler, mm -hmm. you know, you had visions of you with some kind of a crystal ball yeah. and, and et cetera and so forth. And all of that was... Hocus pocus nonsense. Hocus pocus. Was it, it was not? just a hard work of editing a book. That's all that went on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. But, so <clears throat> let's begin by having you tell us then how and why you became interested in an expansionistic view of humanness, particularly its spiritual component, or, you know, I think the way you direct it, its spiritual essentialness. Well, I, that's, that's a very interesting term. It, it's the fact is, what is our essence? Is our essence, our essential being, crying out to us in this the most critical time of human history, where we can no longer to afford to live as half-light versions of who and what we are? I mean, I realize other times in history thought they were it. They're wrong. This is it. You know, this is the time where we really can make the difference as to whether we grow or die. And a lot of people, a lot of people wake up in the morning with a hound of heaven going, ruff, rah, 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 rah. you know, get on with it. And with a sense that their lives have, have at least have the chance of turning a corner, no longer living lives of serial monotony, you know, one thing after another, but rather lives in which they can really begin to activate many different capacities that we all have within ourselves but rarely use, and then to bring these different perspectives sensory and physical capacities, psychological capacities, narrative stories, symbolic, mythic capacities, and above all, the spiritual sourcing capacities. And when you begin to activate these in the human condition, then you bring literally a new mind and a new passion, a new courage, a new incentive to bear upon both your own life, your community life, family life, and even the life of the world. Okay, you know, you have a new free downloadable 75-minute audio seminar titled Three Keys to Discovery and Living Your True Purpose. Yes. Do you believe that everyone is able to honestly learn their purpose in life? And if so, is your approach never, the pragmatic one? I would never say one? everybody. I mean, I just want uh -huh. some people are very happy to be in the same old, same old, um, or unhappy and, and are addicted to their unhappiness. Uh, so I would say that a great many people, in my experience, really feel the urge, the what I call in one of my books, the passion for the possible. And if they feel that passion, I mean, if the people who listen to your show, Eldon, the people who listen to Hey House Radio, the, these are people who are yearning, who are looking. So I would say with regard to your audience, certainly, with regard to people who are caught, you know, in being encapsulated bags of skin dragging around dreary little egos, I would say no. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So it but but I think there's something about the extraordinary times that we're in, you know, where yesterday looks nothing like tomorrow and where we are in a state of literally every system is in deconstruction and reconstruction. Every system is in transition and that includes our own view of ourselves, that we are experiencing or can experience a repatterning of our human nature, a regenesis of our human societies, the breakdown of the membrane between ourselves and the deeper essence that we have, the crossing of the great divide of otherness as we move into what I hope will be within <clears throat> perhaps 50 to 100 years, a planetary culture with high individual, a planetary civilization with high definition of culture, we're in the most interesting times in human history. That's why I say other times thought they were it. They're wrong. This is it. This is really it. Okay. And I but think this is activating us to really become the – to rise out of the latency of who and what we really are and can be. And that's where the whole sense of purpose and a higher order of destiny rises. 
Okay, now, I've heard everything you say, and and it's all pragmatic. It all fits the political scene, the geopolitical environment (laughs) that we're in, et cetera. Serial monotony, you know, hey, you plug into your television every night. You do the same old, same old, you know. Mm -hmm. We all get that. I guess my question is, uh, in discovering your purpose, how do you transcend from the pragmatic to the spiritual, or do you? I think that they are synonymous, you know. I think So you believe our, that it's you believe that it's necessary in our times for there to be a spiritual awakening of sorts. Oh, I think that we're in a time of vast quickening of our spiritual uh, of our spiritual capacities. I, I really believe that. I think it's almost like what we saw in the great axial age, you know, when when in between the sixth and the fourth century B C you had Buddha, you had Lao Tzu, Confucius, uh, Pythagoras, Parmenides, uh, Mahavira, Zoroaster. But these were the great individual uh, evocateurs. And I think what we're finding, at least I find in my work, um, I find a democratization of the spiritual sensibility literally, literally the world over. But if you no. contrast exactly what you said to where we are today, we, you know, we have so much that is it's the Christian second coming. It's the uh, Islamic second coming. And, and both of them are so violently opposed to one another, I, I fail to, to see the inclusiveness. Can you, can you clarify that for Yes, me? certainly. You know, first of all, maybe it's because I travel so much. As I said, I've been in 107 countries and Mm -hmm. worked intensely in some 40 cultures, I do see a world that's very different from the one that is up there on Fox News, say, or in in a lot of the newspapers or media events, which are geared economically to frighten, to excite, to uh, threaten. Now, the world that I do see is, is, let me just give you a little sense of it, it's very, very different. First of all... uh, when you look at who's doing the work, I'm going to make a politically incorrect remark. Who's working all over? Who's doing the work? Who's calling the projects? Who's sustaining them? Who? 70% are women. And that, you know, we talk about this at the UN and we laugh about it, but it's true. And many of them are women of a certain age, you know, whose children have grown and they're mm-hmm. out there really trying to make the difference. Mm-hmm. Another aspect, of course, is that we are interconnected. I mean, just like the great civilizations grew up in the fourth millennium B.C. along the great rivers, you know, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Nile, the Ganges. Now we are in the Internet river of information, and societies are both growing up as well as becoming uh, interconnected. That's why I think we are headed toward a medieval, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a renaissance of, of something that has never been there, there before. I believe okay. that we are in a neo-medieval phase also with our robber barons on Wall, Wall Street, with our, um, <clears throat> you know, cor- corporate fiefdoms, <laughs> with the, the rises of fundamentalisms of every kind. And these, but, you know, what, what followed that? If you look at a fractal nature of history, what followed, of course, was a renaissance, where the psyche became larger than it had been, just out of dire necessity. Now, this, of course, is in the West. In the East, at the same time, you had very different civilizations. But... What you have now, I think, is something that is an inspiriting, which I suspect strongly has a spiritual sourcing. You know, we're in that incredible time of where the zeit is getting geisty, where the spirit is rising, <laughs> and that this is re if you will, us, that is going to result, as it did in the Renaissance, you know, with a, a, a much larger... A sense of possibility, of complexity, of relationship, of art, design, of music, of culture. And I, I see this happening literally all over the world. So we are in a singularity in history. Can I predict this will happen? No, obviously I cannot. But I do see the signs everywhere. All right. Let me, let me ask you this then, Okay. You heard the setup piece, and I know you've been on stage debating the likes of Michael Shermer. So what do you have to say about the so-called expansion of naturalism as it's put forward, you know, by our reductionistic materialists? I mean, how does that – I mean, I see, contrary to what you you have just 
painted in this beautiful picture. I see women being deprived of their rights, 14-year-olds having their nose and their ears cut off and thrown into the stable because they don't please their husband. I I see, you know, efforts to take God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, out of school prayer. I, I, you know, I see this whole rise of of secular humanism in our own country. And, 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 you know, I read the data about... uh, the preponderance of scientists afraid to admit that they even believe in a God. Uh, And at the same time, you know, I read books by Anthony Flew, who was a lifetime atheist. And then, and then at the last minute writes, there is a God. Uh, There seems to be a great area of confusion, a great area, or or shall we say resistance. And and I'm trying to put that picture together with the one you painted. How do you see this? Well, I I see everything that you're seeing, obviously, because I work hands-on, sensory-rich in a lot of developing countries where I have to deal with these kinds of issues all the time. I'm not coming out of a blue sky. I'm coming Mm -hmm. out of very deep existential experience. But but I also see the other side, you know, that, that is emerging. Yes, you have the rise of women to full partnership with men in the whole domain of human affairs, which is probably one of the most critical shifts in human history. And yes, you have terrible backlash. Yes, you have a rising spirit all over the world. Yes, you have fundamentalisms and terrible backlash. Uh, You always have fundamentalisms rising every time you turn the page into essentially a new way of seeing and being and acting. I mean, this is just, just it, it, you, you need a perspective, I think, on the historical patterns of these things. And then you do see that these things are happening. So for every story that you can tell me, and I can tell you a dozen more awful stories that say about what's happening with women, I can sure. probably tell you a hundred stories of women taking initiative, of uh, and maybe of the necessity to have, obviously, in our time. Why does the Dalai Lama say, of all things? That if the world is going to get anywhere, be saved, it's going to be a matter of Western women. You know, and he does say that. I mean, you know, it sort of shocks a lot of my Eastern friends, but that's what he says. Why does why do people in very significant positions say these things? Because it is happening. It is happening because it is a radical necessity if we're going to survive our time. This doesn't mean that women become the matriarchs. It means a much more balanced civilization, which will then allow men yeah. to be who and we, what they we, really we've are. We've got a hard break coming up, Dr. Houston. Sure. We'll pick this up on the back end. And, of course, you know, that, that handles the woman's side. But, you know, I, I'm a ready lot to go this, on with the rest of it, yeah. The reduction is good. We'll pick that up when we we'll okay. come back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment on A House Radio. We're discussing with Dr. Gene Houston the keys to living your true purpose. If you're not already in our chat room, now is a great time to join the conversation and see a short video of Dr. Houston speaking on the possible human. Just go to eldentaylor.com forward slash chat. Stay with us during the break. We'll be right back after these words from some of our friends. Do you feel like you've become lost in a funhouse? Only seeing the reflection of yourself, past, future, and present, but unable to find the real you? I invite you to step through the doorway and onto the path leading to understanding of your mind, your choices, and the influences that surround you. Read Elton Taylor's New York Times best-selling book, Choices and Illusions. Now expanded, updated, and revised, it will provide you with real-life examples of how you can break free from your current perceptions and begin your journey to how high is up. Get your copy today from all bookstores or online from Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Close your eyes. Imagine your goals and dreams. What's preventing you from accomplishing them? Most often, we are our own worst enemies. I can't. I'm not good enough. It's time to reprogram that inner dialogue. Replace all those negative self-images with, I'm good. I am powerful. I can do anything. Eldon Taylor's Inner Talk patented subliminal technology does just that. Researched at numerous universities such as Stanford and by governments such as Mexico and Germany, Inner Talk has repeatedly been proven effective 
at changing your self-talk. Stop imagining your goals and make them a reality today. Visit www.innertalk.com. That's I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K dot com. Innertalk dot com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're discussing the three keys to living your true purpose with Dr. Gene Houston. But before we get back to today's show, I want to invite you to like our Facebook fan page for Provocative Enlightenment Radio. As a fan of the show, you'll receive special announcements and incentives from time to time as our way of thanking you for your support. I would also like to invite you to join me on Facebook while you're there, and of course, you can follow me on Twitter. If you like our show, spread the word. We genuinely appreciate your support. I also want to remind you that my New York Times bestselling book, Choices and Illusions, is available on sale for your Kindle or Nook for only 99 cents. I don't know who or how they figured that one out, but I strongly urge you to get it while it's priced that low. One last thing, for those of you that are lucubrators and find yourself up in the wee hours of the morning, I will be making a guest appearance on Coast to Coast with George Nury on Thursday, August 11th, from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Join us if you're still up. Give me a call. All right, let's get back to the show. Before the break, we're discussing, we were discussing actually two things, uh, Dr. Houston, and, and you got the first one, the female side of the story, but how about the materialist side of the story? Well, we, we've been materialists for a very long time, haven't we? I mean, especially well, but not in the sense that we have the reductionistic materialism. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, absolutely not, not to this extreme. We're seeing an extremism of the protection of the materialistic mode. Uh, right. I'm, I'm, thinking of, <laughs> I'm thinking of William Blake, who said, May God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep, thinking of, you know, the galaxy of effects that, <laughs> yes, that yes. came from Mr. Newton. But the, idea, the irony is that when Mr. Newton was not being uh, scientific and insular, you, you know what he was. He was an alchemist. He was involved in all kinds of alternate was ways a mystic, of thinking. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, what I have found in knowing some of these people, the reductionist people, is that they have these other private concerns. I mean, you take Michael Shermer, who is a enormously spirited bicycle rider who gets into these ecstatic states while, you know, pedaling away across right. the country. You know? <laughs> and uh, I think the funniest was uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, the the you know the behaviorist Skinner you know B. F. Skinner oh B. F. Skinner and and mm-hmm. the nicest compliment I ever got in my life I got from B. F. Skinner because we were to debate together at Harvard and he sent uh-huh. me a telegram a telegram day saying dear Gene I don't want to debate with you I wouldn't find it reinforcing and it, <laughs> when when you look at his life he played he was a organist. A, 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 doing a Bach on the organ. He was a scholar mm-hmm. of Dante. He was an extraordinary humanistic man in his private life. But he, uh, and, and I had a conversation with him. I said, well, given these things, why are you so didactic on, on, this, on this, you know, Skinnerian kind of philosophy you, which seems yeah. to cut you off from spirit? And he said, my dear, it's because I am so frightened for what is happening to the human race, that they are going mad irrational, we're going to blow ourselves up, and so I'm looking for forms of containment that, so that we have time to reconstruct ourselves. So you uh, kind of have a Soren Kierkegaard perspective. Don't listen to what they say. Look at what they do, how they live. Huh? Very much so. I mean, I, I think that a lot of people, uh, you know, Michael Shermer is not a materialist, but what he is is someone who is deeply concerned that the the great irrational structure will move in, and we see it happening certainly in our own government right now. So yes, at a certain point, well, he he, he certainly goes after Michael goes after, uh, say Deepak Chopra's interpretation yes. of physics, and 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 how he uses that to support. Uh, yes. 
a, a spiritual perspective. And I and I think that's one of the things that gets lost in this whole contest is that, you know, very often the irritation uh, is not over spirituality per se. Yeah. Uh, it, it's over what's used as the argument to set down the basis for spirituality. Well, and, and many of the arguments are yeah. just they're false to fact or, you know, they just simply are abuses of our sciences. Let's let's get into your work. Now, I have to ask this first because I, I have really enjoyed your, your work for, as I said in the setup piece, many, many years. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I know how important history and myth is to you. Yes. And, and you were a personal friend of Joseph Campbell, Very I believe. Very close friend. We did many seminars together. You know, uh, his work in mythology, in my opinion, is the signature work of our era. I, it I had agree. to influence you. How, how did it do so, and does it continue to today? Yes, I think uh, when I was 11 years old, my father gave me a copy of The Hero's Journey, you know, uh-huh. and that became a, a biblical for me, <laughs> scriptural. In my own book, my own autobiography, A Mythic Life, I actually have a whole chapter about how at 11 I tried to live out of, of uh, Joseph Campbell's categories. Um, and so we, we were good friends, as I said, we did a lot of work together. I think his his major thematic in so much of his work, which had to do with the journey of the hero that he he mm-hmm. found he found in 240 cultures, you feel a call. Whoa, yes, and then you refuse the call. Oh no, no, not not now. Later, maybe when the kids grow up, maybe when I can pay my taxes, and then you can't stand it yourself, and so you agree to the call, and you discover that the universe gets interested in you, and all these different allies begin to show up, but then you've got to transcend all your old objections which are there in in the mythic form in the the guardian of the gates often a monster uh, often given to fixed attitudes the superintendent of schools or whoever it is and you have to get past that guardian get past your old stuff you know you fall into the belly of the whale meaning you need a time of recreation of regeneration it's becoming almost knowing yourself as a fetus of your higher self and then begins the road of adventures where you really confront the major challenges of your life. Until finally, in the nadir of the mythological world, you meet the beloved. Now, whether the beloved is a new construction or a kind of spiritual beloved, I wrote a whole book about it called The Search right. for the Beloved. And you find the great book. bones, the deeper templates, the new passions, the, the wider perspective, and you take this back into time and become a master of two worlds the world of space and time, and having access to the depths. I mean, a tremendous itinerary of psychological development and deepening, which I find to be largely true in many, many, many of the great mythic structures, because a myth is something that never was but is always happening. It's like the coded DNA of the human psyche that gives us the rest of our possibilities. And so I find in whatever culture that I'm working with, I always look for what is their core myth. You know, so if I'm in right. say, India, I'll work with the Ramayana. You know, if I'm in England, I might work with the Parsifal, the Grail myths, or wherever. Because, and then I weave processes of development along the lines of what each major stage of the myth tells us about the development of ourselves. Okay, now you correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, one of the distinctions that I see between Joseph Campbell and yourself is that, of course, Campbell laid out this whole hero myth. Yes. Uh, but it was by culture, and, and you use that, as you just mentioned today. Your work takes that myth, and it becomes a template for an individual. Every individual, and it isn't that they have to climb an unclimbable mountain or they have to uh, defeat some undefeatable foe. It is that they are called, as you put it, and and they put away the calling. And the calling could be something simple to begin with. It might be attend one of your seminars, for that matter. Uh, and I find the way that you have done that to be particularly compelling. Have you, did you do that on intention, or do I have it all wrong in the first place? No, I always did it in, in, intentionally. When Joe and I worked together, he would tell the story. And then I would create processes and exercises, not just to illumine the story, but to illumine the 
the, the possibilities, the template of a person's life. You know, when he died, the day after he died, I had a dream, and I fought the pillow all night because I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. And in the dream, Joe came to me and he said, Jean, I want you to work with, help me with the correspondence correspondence. Joe, you never answered your correspondence. You were 18 years behind your correspondence. <laughs> it's true. And he kept at it and at me, and, and I couldn't understand it until finally a friend said, Jean, he's not talking about letters. He's talking about the correspondences, the correspondence between myth and history, myth and economics, myth and human relationships. And I said, wow, that's it. So in my own work, when I work mythically in some of the books that I've written about uh, myth, I always look at the correspondence of myth as an evocative, a guiding uh, metaphor that illumines our, our possibilities at every possible level. All right. You know, you have known some of the best. You are among the best. I have oh, a great that. pleasure just speaking with you. Let's jump a little further into what it is that you're doing. According to Gallup, 8 in 10 Americans say they are satisfied with their personal lives at this time. Mm -hmm. including a solid majority who say they're very satisfied. Now, this personal satisfaction level contrasts sharply with the low level of satisfactions Americans seem to have with how the United States is going today. Mm -hmm. But still, many Americans currently are searching for a purpose, a meaning to their life. You know, I, I like how you put it, serial monotony, mm -hmm. uh, how they escape that. So... Uh, what, what, you know, if, if it's not all about, uh, being unsatisfied with a career choice or, you know, just same old, same old, what do you think it is that causes this unsettled feeling, this, this questioning in the first place? I think it's the unsettling of the times, the uniqueness of the times, challenges arising, I mean, geo geopolitical challenges, climactic ecological challenges, challenges with regard to our our economy. The, these are unsettling times. We, we're on, in very shaky boats here. Uh, you know, where, they, where the, the ground of our being is rumbling just like the ground of the volcanoes and the tsunamis and everything that is, that is mm -hmm. hitting us. I, and I think there are psychodynamic levels to that. We, we cannot live out of the same kinds of things for which we've been trained. You know, when, when I, you work know, with, I work with leadership, often very top leadership all over the world, and uh -huh. I find that too many of them have been trained to be, now this is an exaggeration, but it's a funny idea, to be white males of the year 1926. You know, they've not been <laughs> trained for the complexity of, of our time. And so I think it is the... That, they, that we are organism environments. We are symbiotic with the fields and the, the nature and the time of our lives. And so this, this shakes us at our foundation, and it also shakes up, I believe, the deep latencies that say it's time to get on with it. And so that we, we live, as, as, as I say, as just partial versions of who we are, and that you always find that you have big periods of human development during big times of human uncertainty, where the, where the ground of being is being shaken. So okay. what is rising in so many people is a sense of, I do have more to do and to be. And I, so you... I, I, find this, I find this universally, to I mean to be so, whether I'm okay. working with the head of state or the man who pushes the broom in his leper colony. I mean, I just find it to be so. Um, and... and so I look at then what are the dimensions of training people up to be adequate stewards of their lives and their selves and of the world. Because it really, first of all, you've got the world mind taking a walk with itself. So you have something that I've been doing for many, many years, the harvesting of the human capacities, the way different cultures activate different capacities to think, to see, to be, to dream, to do. And this has nothing to do with you know, the, the ethnic types at all. I mean, I'm off tomorrow, uh, first to Seattle to do seminars on social artistry, and then uh, up the Alaska in, into the Yupik and the Tlingit and the Inuit. Why do these Inuit people, for example, why is it that they make such extraordinary mechanics? They can look at an automobile engine, and they walk around it in their mind, and they can fix it. Why? 
it's because of the nature where they have the snow falling all the time. <laughs> they have to have incredible internal imagery. Why does uh, a, a culture in West Africa, a culture that I worked with, have no warfare as we understand it, a neurosis? It's because they solve problems differently. They dance the problem. They sing it. They drum it. They they become ecstatic about it. They tap into levels of themselves through music and dance and, and visualization, and they solve the problem. You know, as I've been sent around the world, Margaret Mead sent me around the world in the early 70s. She said, Jane, go out and harvest the human potential, because when we can harvest it, we'll know very much more about ourselves. So this is what I've done. And then bringing these kinds of capacities to bear upon our regular life. This is the first time in human history, Eldon, that we actually have an understanding of the great reservoir of human capacities that we all have. We activate them and then we bring them to bear upon our social, our family, our communal issues. Uh, You're on record as basically saying that our true purpose in today's complex times has more to do with something other than the passion to make a difference. And and, and, yeah. and I'm on record as saying, you know, our purpose is service. And, uh, yes. you yes. know, uh, uh, so w- what is the the more than the service, the more? W- what is that that is a part of our passion or part of our purpose? I think it is. I love your questions. I mean, they're 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 feisty and rich and. <laughs> and, uh, They're not intended to be feisty. Too. I love plenty questions. Great. Um, I, I think it is that we are in a place of joining a larger universe. I really do believe that. You know that we are uh, in what in the very beginnings of of you know, just the beginnings, the antechambers of joining a universe that is larger than our aspiration and more complex than all our dreams. We might call it first stage higher civilization, where we become stewards of the planet and not just our children. And I, uh, I really believe that we're that. And then some hundreds and hundreds of months down the line from that, maybe we're joining the solar system, you know, and then maybe we ultimately join the galactic milieu. I don't know. I mean, this is science fiction thought, but I suspect that we have to enlarge our own internal continents of spirit before we can really join this larger universe. So it's a huge shaking up. If we are Earth beings and we're part of Earth history, then the Earth is requiring this kind of training for us. Maybe we are in God school. I mean, maybe this little planet, which is uh, exists in a in a in a um, you know in in a solar system that is at the corner of the galaxy. We're not in the center where all the action is. We're at the corner. This is the skunk works. You know, <laughs> this, this is where you really put your experimental lab. And God knows we have enough crisis and complexity and and creativity to to call us into this extraordinary training. So maybe these are the training grounds. At least that's my own personal myth about it. I love your thoughts. You know that. But okay, let me let me do this then. I I, I could ask you a, a dozen more of these feisty questions, although they're not intended to be that way. <laughs> uh, but you know, you have a, an opportunity coming up, and and I want you to tell our audience about this opportunity, and then I'm going to come back to some of my questions. But I don't I don't want them to miss out on this. You you've got a special seminar that's coming up that everybody can get to. Tell them about that. Tell them where it is. Tell them how they register. Tell them how they reach you, and then I'm going to come back to these questions because okay. I, okay? Yeah, I'm doing a seven week uh, course on awakening. Uh, to your purpose and destiny, and you can find out about it on purposeanddestiny.net. Or a simpler one is destinyandyou.com. Go to destinyandyou.com, and there will be a free 75-minute teleseminar where I discuss ways in which we activate many, many different potentials within you that then give you much greater clarity as to your purpose. Uh, Destinyandyou.com. And uh, so it, it's 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 introductory. It gives you wonderful, short, interesting exercises. And then, if you want, it invites you to a very inexpensive seven-week course with lots of bonuses that you can take. And then, following that, if you want a more advanced twelve-week course, destinyandyou.com. And I think you'll be very you'll be very surprised at uh, 
there's been a 75 minute free seminar about what what you can discover about yourself and what you yet can and, be and they can see that 75 minute seminar at destinyandyou.com that's right destiny and and are we spelling the U out, Y-O-U, Y-O-U or is yeah, that the a whole thing. Y-O-U? Yes, okay. Yes. Now, activating. You use the word activating. Yes. Uh, tell me three keys that activate our life purpose. And give me a brief description of what you're talking about. Well, uh, one is, is to activate a very different perspective on your, on your life. I mean, belief does structure reality. And to realize that... You are a citizen in a universe that is that has all manner of capacities, both within and without. And you don't just live in the universe. The universe lives in you. And so part of the thing is to activate your capacity to see yourself. It's a great paradigm change to see yourself as one who can tap into and these enormous capacities and come alive in a whole new way with them. And then we, uh, we give you skills. We, I give you skills to not only in terms of the uh, greatly enhancing your sensory capacities, not just the outward ones, but the inward ones, so that you can take almost any project, idea, something that you want to do, and you will just have simply many more inner capacities, especially the ones that have to do with creativity and imagination to make these these great uh, ideas and projects happen so that you can begin. To, it's sort of the art and science of manifestation at a much higher level. And then, of course, the, the psychological capacities. We are not simply, uh, this, as I say, this doddering ego. Ego is but one image among the multiple images and passions of the possible within ourselves so that we show you how to tap into other persona, other skills. For example, I hate to write. I hate it, hate it, hate it. I am phobic for writing. <laughs> but I have 26 books out there, and I have, believe it or not, 260 unpublished 400-page manuscripts. I write a small book every month for wow. my, my mystery school. That's how it happens. And by the time it's actually delivered, it's 400 pages. You know, um, the, But I'll show you. But it happens to be that I'm a very good cook for many reasons, but I am a very good cook. There's two things I do very well in the world, Eldon. I can talk to any dog, and I'm a very good cook. So, <laughs> but, so I bring in my cook persona every time I have to write. I, I literally become the cook, and I stir in a melange of ideas, and I add you know, the spices of this association or that, and I'm quite free, and that's how I do all this writing. I can show people how to actually actualize these different realities personas that they have within them and bring the different set of both moods and feelings and skills to anything that they want to do. I mean, that's a very simple thing. I mean, the, the work we do is really very complex, but this is just a simple. Mythically, you all have another story. Get beneath the surface crust of consciousness. Not only is there a remarkable amount of creativity waiting to be tapped, but there is also a very different story for you. Ready, ready to be engaged and then spiritually we are living you know often on the surface of this immense spiritual nature that is ready to ask you to join this larger reality and what right. are some of the spiritual meta technologies that help you get there in about 50 seconds what's the most important thing our listening audience can do today to improve their lives well, one of the things that they can do is to be conscious, to be awake, to be aware, to go off of robot, to really pay attention to nature and to the world around, That and, and to carry a notebook. How's that? To carry a notebook at anything that happens that is really interesting or just, you know, seizes their imagination. Uh, uh, write it down. Reflect on it. Become conscious. Consciousness is ultimately what it all it is all about i mean the natural uh, nature of our time is to the elevation of consciousness as our fundamental life work and this is the condition of our humanity it is the entrance to new ways of being it is the way in which we really wake up and when we wake up then the reality knows that they've got a live one and it wakes up to us and things happen <laughs> thank you very much dr houston uh, enjoyed the conversation very much. Thank uh, you. I enjoyed it too. <laughs>
We've come to the end of another hour of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank you all for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed our show. And we'll join us again next week, same time and same place. And if you have comments on our show, do let us know. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always...